I think we will mostly get started. My, my name's Corey, um, and I help run um, Z Fellows, which is this kind of one week experiment. It's a very kind of like low commitment uh, accelerator where 10 or 15 builders come to learn and get inspired um, uh, for a week. And today we're doing a little experiment here where we've invited a um, Z Fellow mentor to give a talk um, in front of a live audience. And I'm excited to welcome and introduce Kevin Hartz. Um, he is an entrepreneur and investor who's made um, a significant impact in the technology world over the last few decades. Um, he co-founded two big companies that I'm sure some of y'all have heard of, Eventbrite and Zoom. And uh, he's also an incredible investor that's seed funded a number of companies that I'm sure we've all heard of, um, like Airbnb and PayPal and Trulia, Pinterest and Dural and many more. And um, he's gonna give a uh, a talk that I saw him making in the car today, um, uh, which I love the title, In the History of the World, No One Has Ever Washed a Rental Car. Um, Kevin, thank you for, for speaking. Corey. Corey, thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. And it's always lovely when uh, the moderator just throws you under the bus, like right at the beginning of a talk. Um, so, you know, Quid pro quo, like I found out some great news tonight in that um, we're illicitly using this room. Uh, it's not an official Stanford University event. And so we might have to edit the video now and probably cut this part of it out. But that's great, actually. It's, it's actually like what you want to see is like how to hack uh, the system. So I'm actually really proud to be a part of this, even though I might get banned from campus now. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, first of all, uh, the uh, or the second of all is the the Zoom thing. Like I'm not Eric. Uh, it's Zoom with an X, X O O M, and uh, I launched a money remittance company a while back, and we help immigrants send money back to their families. And we were actually the first developer on the PayPal API. So I was friends with a guy named David Sachs, and convinced him to hire somebody named Dave McClure. Uh, to be the developer head and um, open up an API. And uh, the quick history of that company is we wanted to beat Western Union, which was a big, bad, horrible company that fleeced poor immigrants that would come into the United States and then charge them all these fees to send the FX rates to send money back. And um, I, you know, I think we had a big, uh, a, a big role in undermining that. The company went public in 2013, and then. PayPal ironically acquired us uh, for just over a billion dollars in 2015. Um, so that's that's it. And, and then Eventbrite, um, I left there uh, a few years back, uh, was CEO there for a good run, and then handed the baton off to my wonderful um, and amazing wife and co-founder, Julia, who's CEO today, and um, took the company public in 2018. And then she, um, and luckily not me, steered the company through just the hor like the worst time you can imagine to be a live events uh, business uh, during COVID, where uh, she actually, in 2019, the company sold, what, like $5 billion worth of tickets. Um, and then in March of 2020, we actually had negative revenue as a public company, which is like a horrifying experience. But she got in there and fixed things up. But um, I'm going to like ask a question like first there's this weird title in the history of the world. No one has ever washed a rental car. Like uh, what do you think this title means? Is it maybe a show of hands. If anyone wants to take a stab at it. Uh, who am I? Who are they? Okay. I'm just trying to like. Okay. Yellow shirt right there. He basically answered the question, and it was like too good of an answer. I'm really upset now. He basically said, like, um, when you don't own something, you don't care about it as much, uh, and versus you know something you you don't know, or you own that you really care and take care of. Uh, and in this case, is something that always rang true. I don't know if anyone rents cars anymore, but like you just don't. You always say, oh, don't worry, it's a rental. Like that's an expression. Um, this term is apparently, I had to look, look it up because I heard it a couple of years ago, uh, Jeff Bezos used it 
in a talk at the Sun Valley Conference, um, at the Allen Company Sun Valley Conference, and you know, kind of mentioned it. And so I, I looked it up, and, and it's uh, Larry Summers is like credited as saying this. Uh, but then you go back a little bit more, and they, I think Madeleine Albright might have like thrown it out somehow. And then it derives from a like 1980s uh, textbook on management. But um, the one thing is that everything's like mimetic or nothing's original. And so I love original thought. And I hope like one thing is that we hear or that we see some original thinking and, and, and work from the, the room here. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about this concept and why it's important now. And, you know, like another example, like I, I, there's an Airbnb example. I was fortunate to be involved in Airbnb early on where uh, somebody celebrated a family celebrated Christmas in an Airbnb, and they had uh, hammered a Christmas tree. They didn't have a Christmas tree stand, and so they hammered the Christmas tree into the hardwood floor <laughs> of the home. And that's, you know, again, like you don't own it. It's, you know, like that, that concept. Um, and, you know, that applies very much to companies. Now, um, I was running around like, the, I actually did this before I got in the car. But I was trying to come up asking people, like, what's a company that nobody really cares about or that nobody that's an employee really cares about? Is it like an old, uh, you know, AT&T or something or Verizon? I don't know. But the DMV was the best because, like, the employees, and it, it, it's part of the government, but you get the notion is that at the DMV, nobody cares about, uh, like, making things work and being successful. You wait in line. Everyone's extremely unhappy if you took a net promoter score that you would be like on average like 0.5 at, at best, uh, or it'd be negative if it, it could. And, and there nobody cares. They don't feel a sense of ownership uh, over that. Um, and this is me, you know, like being a cranky old guy, like, like a little like, I don't know, if like I'm jaded or bitter or something. But I'm like, I'm going to go into this like, oh, you know, like back in my day. But no, it's this, this kind of behavior has always been present. It's grown, I've noticed, in tech. And maybe, again, like maybe I'm just being uh, grouchy and um, reminiscing on the quote unquote good old days. Um, but, uh, you know, a few things like we've seen COVID, you know, of course, uh, everyone um, kind of isolated, working at home, uh, has really accelerated this like uh, mode. It kind of gave people the opportunity. You know, some some people really dug in, but others really kind of pulled away. Um, it was, of course, traumatic and uh, for a lot of people, it was pretty challenging for me. But um, you know, you had the notion of quiet quitting and all these other. Um, you know, phenomena of play where, you know, you'd have an engineer that would work two other jobs. Uh, no, you know, many companies kind of going through this. You work at one company full time. You don't have a LinkedIn profile. You work at, you know, other companies. And this has been really happening. Uh, people have been incredibly disengaged. And then the other thing I attribute to it, to it is that, like, startups used to be, like, kind of the outcast. So, you know, like, back in, like, 1983, this, you know, like when you talk or when you made films about uh, computer, like hackers and programmers, they were always like the rebels and getting into trouble, but they really like were trying to do something great. Um, but it was always like sort of counterculture and, and very minor. And then there was this like kind of point where um, the, the Facebook movie came out um, and of course, the whole Facebook team goes to see it, um, you know, the opening and everything. And it was kind of really good for Facebook and kind of really bad. And it, it was like at that precipice of change. Uh, and then fast forward to, you know, the last, I think this is all the last year. I don't even think Dropout, the Elizabeth Holmes uh, film, is, is that out yet? Now you have like, you know, top actors. Um, and yes, Hackers has Angelina Jolie, but nobody knew her at that point. And um, who was that? Matthew Broderick, I think that was like one of his early first roles. Uh, but now it's just, you know, like uh, center stage, mainstream. 
And so think of tech this, think of tech the same way, way. Think of it as like this little cod, cottage industry. Think of like Hollywood in like maybe the 1920s or something like that, or, or Detroit as cars were just starting. Uh, and now it's um, part of every bit of society. And you know it's had a massive impact on Stanford campus. So uh, it used to be, I think, economics was like the most popular major, but only you know, like 15% or so. And now CS, like if you would have asked somebody 20 years ago, would CS be the most popular major at Stanford? Like they would laugh. They would say, that's impossible. Um, that's crazy. And now what, does anyone know the percent of last year's class that was CS? It's a very high percentage and it's the largest major. Um, and so, you know, we, we're in this world where also tech has like grown so much that, you know, the people that used to, not go into tech to go into all these other professions are now all in tech. And so um, I think people are up in arms and alarmed when they get accused of like not working 100 hour work weeks um, or not sleeping in the office or um, getting laid off or getting fired. Uh, when in fact, like that's the whole point of a startup. It was like, this is a professional sports team you're here to build something incredibly important. You're going to impact and change the world. Um, and, but yet, you know, like San Francisco is going to tell you, you can't have a bed inside of your office now because it violates uh, code. Like, that's crazy. Like, that's uh, absurd. So see, I'm all worked up and angry now. <laughs> I'm like going to go and protest somewhere. Um, in this like concept, uh, this I like stole flagrantly. Everyone steals things. Like probably Peter Thiel has like the most original uh, like thinking of I think like almost any human on the planet. And more people like steal Peter's like original thoughts than than one can imagine because he you know he just kind of keeps himself and they kind of like filter out and then somebody adopts it. But um, you know he had once. Uh, we were speaking about this a couple of years ago, um, and you know he kind of noticed this pattern, like you know in the '80s and on, and even before that, like you know your parents and your aspiration was to become a doctor or a lawyer, like that was like the the thing to do. And then like the lawyers all sued the doctors, uh, and you know it became a miserable or somewhat miserable profession in the United States, and you saw a decline of that, and then everyone realized how miserable it is to be a lawyer. Like that's even worse. Um, at least doctors are helping people. Um, and so then it was like, you know, management consultant or, or banker, like a management consultant was somebody who like performed academically very high and like solved, you know, like riddles and quizzes that were supposed to be clever, like why is a manhole round and things like that, how many gas stations are in the United States. And then the investment banker, uh, like that was the other way. It was like, you were gonna make a lot of money and, but you know, you graduate from Stanford, you go banking and then you go to Harvard Business School and then you're set for life. And now like that kind of herd of people that would in that one era became a doctor or a lawyer and that other area became a management consultant or a banker, uh, you know, are now like, Y, uh, you know, YC, NYC are starting companies. And uh, we were talking about this right prior and I was, I was about to like tackle you because I didn't want you to give away like all my talk and you know, speech tonight. But uh, effectively, like it's very hard to tell somebody who really is in this because they really care about forwarding technology, innovation, like having a positive impact on people's lives versus somebody that, you know, wants to make Forbes 30 under 30 and, um, you know, get their photo taken and like make a lot of money and don't really care about the mission of the business because there's such a body of research, uh, whether, you know, podcasts or uh, Paul Graham's essays or so on out there. And so it's incredibly hard for uh, investors. I'm not an investor. I'm supposed to be an investor, but like I consider myself a founder and I get upset when people call me a venture capitalist because it's like a dirty word. But um, anyway, in, uh, some invest investors have a hard time distinguishing like who is an authentically 
like in this for the right reasons versus like this actor type. So um, what does that mean for all of you? Um, I don't know. I just wanted to like get that out in the world, uh, you know, like make that point. Um, one, to make sure everyone's doing this for the right reason, because this is going to be all consuming or it should be all consuming. Um, it should be everything you care about. It should be like the best, most important time of your life when you're in it and really enjoying it. Um, but it's also going to be like some of the worst periods of your life and things are fraught with mental illness and depression, anxiety and bad news. And, uh, you know, it's just not all up and to the right, but it's like the most incredible journey and um, still gives me goosebumps to like think about like the great times that when you find the right set of people, they're phenomenally brilliant people and you have the honor to like work with these people and build something and, and make an impact, there's just uh, nothing better. So um, that's like, I guess the message I wanna impart. Is that a good message, Corey? Yeah, well, let's turn it over to questions then. Um, and this is like, can be fairly more open. Um, and I won't try to head shrink you if you're like faking it and really want to become a lawyer. Yes. Um, good question. Yes. So the question is like, what what does one look for? What would I look for, you know, as an investor, or if I were actually a venture capitalist, because maybe I have a fund called A Star, um, but I still think of myself as a founder. Uh, but um, yes. And first, you know, I want to point out that most venture capitalists are entirely motivated around money. Um, so like, it's kind of the pot calling the kettle black. But uh, nobody thinks that's funny except for me. Um, but uh, but the okay attributes. So you know we're really looking like I, I like the earliest stages of a, a company the most, kind of like or, or of you know I like the founding stages of a business much like Corey and Z Fellows is like you know there's just something magical um, about that that early stage, but it's also like you know, you're trying to find, um, you know, that one of a kind person that has, say, overcome incredible obstacles through their lives. Like, you know, if I recall, Max Levchin is from the Ukraine and he was growing up, his parents, his mom, I think was a scientist and knew that Chernobyl was, there was the Chernobyl meltdown. He fled the company, the country you know, with his parents and just the clothes on their back and came to the United States, had to work, you know, he worked a job in like air traffic control programming uh, and like dumpster dive for computer parts. Um, so, you know, check the box of like somebody that came from, you know, nothing, check the box of, uh, you know, mom, a scientist, like, you know, very academic, Intellect, uh, intellectual family. Dad, I think, was a musician. You know, so this interesting mix. Um, he's always very competitive, incredibly competitive. So you're looking at these these elements of of like overcoming obstacles, um, intellectual capacity, and so on. Um, and yeah, and, and and he was just always very hungry and and, and driven. Um, yeah, like that's, you know, I think like maybe that's where I have to admit I don't fit as a typical founder. Like the way I've, um, the way I maybe reconcile it is my mom grew up on a farm in the Midwest and, you know, they had an outhouse and she rode her horse to school um, and you had to get up at four in the morning to like milk the cows. And so there's, I, I refer to it as what first generation off the farm. Um, which you have an incredible work ethic. So I just like grind and grind and grind uh, relentlessly. Um, 
But yeah, like I, I think it's very hard to distinguish now. Um, but I generally do. It's not a it's not a job application investing. So you can ask all these personal questions that are illegal to ask if you were interviewing for a job in California. I think they're fairly intertwined. Uh, so the question is around um, like a love of the company and in the that kind of internal experience and and the love of like the product and building and so on. Um, you know, maybe if, you know, maybe if you just think of it as, you know, like a pie chart, you know, it's cut one way or the other, but there's a little bit of both of it. Um, and anyway, if anyone loves building products or loves like, like that, you know, like that glee that comes when you wake up and like, so many people have signed up and are using the product. Um, like it's incredibly addictive. It's it's like a challenge. It's interesting. Or yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think there's like a right or wrong answer about purpose or product process. Um, because, you know, if one is enamored with both, like don't all of a sudden start second guessing yourself if you're like in that category or not, um, you know, it comes from doing and you just have to kind of try it out and, and see how it's, you know, happening. Um, um, it's a good question though. Who's next? All right, in the back. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious how you kind of think of the other different components of this um, innovation that you did with yourself. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. um, you go through a period of viewfinding, and also, like, what is that, and how do you know that, like, uh, you know, it's time for you to really focus on the craft of what you're doing? Like, mm -hmm. what are the strengths that you're working on? Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with, like, other things that you're doing. Um, great questions. Um, so, zooming back, like, somebody did their homework. So the question was like about my background, about Silicon Graphics, my first tech gig, um, about how I founded Zoom, a money remittance um, company that like, how did I have like the understanding or so on to go into that market? Like Silicon Graphics, like I, I was a product manager there. I found out it was time to leave when I was fired. Um, and so I wasn't able to go back in the building um, at that point. And so I was uh, at that point forced to uh, start a company. I started a company called Connect Group actually with some friends from Stanford. And we incorporated in April and the company was acquired in October by a public company. It wasn't anything like spectacular, but it was kind of like one of these like YC quick flips. Um, and I ended up with some, a little bit of money and um, invested Peter, Teal and Max Lepchen, or Peter Teal came back to the Valley. We met up and Peter quickly um, connected with Max Lepchen and they started what became PayPal and I invested some money. And so I watched PayPal grow. And um, so I got to be in the front row of watching a phenomenon happen. And this is a very, your question's very important from this point of like, how did I know? Like um, the entire, like this is the dot one oh collapse. Um, which I hate to always bring up because it gives you an impression of how ancient I am. Um, uh, and, you know, like the entire tech market was just demolished, except for these companies kind of almost operating. I wouldn't say, in, you know, like they were in plain sight, but there was this like this conventional thought that everything was dead in, in the internet space. Um, but yet there was Amazon cranking along and Netflix cranking along 
and what else? Um, Google, of course, was cranking along, and and PayPal was one of those. And so, you know, I had this like front row seat watching PayPal grow, but PayPal's volume was all concentrated on a single marketplace. It was like 95, at the time of the IPO, it was like 95% um, concentrated on eBay. And so the pitch I gave to you, we were trying to raise money from PayPal as our, to be our seed investor, was that if you open up an API, like we'll build and help you get off eBay volume um, is what they called it. Um, and, um, you know, with that, like, uh, I, I would talk to uh, their CFO, Rolf Botha, who's now at Sequoia, and Peter Thiel, and we were talking, and they kept saying, if we had more time, we'd, do, we'd go into this market that Western Union's in because they're terrible. Um, and we went, my business partner, Alan, and I went ahead and built a remittance app. And um, we actually built like four or five different apps like at the same time, which is something I recommend um, especially in this world of, you know, new APIs like GPT-3 and soon 4, um, is to build a lot of different things and just test and, and get a feel for it. And like the remittance was almost like the seemingly least um, like likely in one's mind to do well. And it just, it took off um, and it was amazing. It was amazing to see somebody in like, Washington Heights in New York, um, get online, send money, and it would, and we could disperse it. And our first test market was the uh, Dominican Republic, uh, and you know, within like minutes, it you know, we there a courier would go and deliver the money to the person, the mother's home, and it would be there in forty minutes. It's like faster than DoorDash, um, and we were like, wow. And um, Peter like kind of leaving out a lot of details, PayPal got acquired by eBay. Peter left immediately, Roloff went to Sequoia. Peter did our seed round, Roloff did our Series A, and we were off to the races. So there you have it. Yes? Um, so it's easy to have ownership yourself, but how do you extend that ownership into your, your hiring? Oh, that's a good question. Like it's easy to have ownership ourselves. I'm trying to get used to repeating the question, but how do you extend that to the rest of the company? That was the whole point of the talk, and I forgot about it. Um, <laughs> thank God you asked that question. <laughs> this is what happens when you write the talk in the car. Um, so, yeah, that's incredibly important. Like, um, cash isn't it. Um, and in fact, you could say it's like inversely correlated with ownership. And so, um, you know, like, you can effectively like work with a team that has like you know find people that that are very mission driven and mission oriented that have like an affinity to what you're doing and what you're building and the impact it'll have um, and you can use equity um, and you know equity obviously equals ownership um, and you don't have to own you know 20 percent of the company to feel like that sense of ownership we've all met people, we all know people that, you know, act like owners. And, but a lot of that um, is up to the founders, like to instill that, uh, you know, that, that sense of ownership in terms of like how you act and behave, like how you work with customers and treat customers, um, how you, um, you know, the effort you put in, uh, the type of people you hire, like hiring is incredibly important. We must have up until like almost 200 employees, uh, Julie and I uh, in Renault, our third co-founder interviewed almost um, everyone, you know, for that. And part of that was to impress upon, um, the, the like a main part of that was actually to impress upon the rest of the team, the, the you know, the, the the team we're working with that, what kind of values we were looking with, we're looking for. So for example, like we'd interview an engineer um, and then we would all sit together, you know, six of us team members would, would debrief about the person and talk about what we liked and didn't like, what they were good at and not good at, what, uh, and, you know, that was a chance to kind of instill what your beliefs and feelings are. And that's how a culture is kind of spread through a company. Um, 
and you know a culture can be very transactional and um, cash oriented or like greed oriented or it can be more mission oriented and build oriented and so on um, but finding those touch points to kind of very much demonstrate your values and show like the ownership and how much you care um, like really reflects and and goes a long way Uh, I l always loved hiring very, very smart generalists in, you know, in any area. And, and like, that was kind of my, you know, like seeing PayPal, for example, which was like a, you know, OG fintech company, not a single person there came from the fintech space. And every time they'd hire somebody from, or sorry, from the finance or the, uh, yeah, like old fintech space, like the person never lasted. <laughs> like. Um, so, uh, yeah, smart generalist, obviously that Elon Musk guy that did zip two and then PayPal and then built a rocket company and a car company shows like, like I'm drink. The generalists are always better than specialist, uh, Kool-Aid. Yes. Yeah. Two part question. You, um, mentioned how startups are looking to stay glamorized on media. Um, do you believe that there are certain subfields within tech which uh, attract the investor venture type, investment venture type? And you also think in 10 years, startup founders will go almost software as a movement to hack into the tech? Um, so the first question was, um, like, are there certain areas of tech that attract? Yeah. Um, and then the second is, will we, will we continue in this, like, progression of, of mainstreaming and... Um, um, well, I think like, you know, growth and, you know, there's like kind of a claim and money always attracts, you know, a, a certain set of people. Um, and it's not like I'm a socialist or anything, um, you know, like, uh, I, you know, don't mind, um, you know, like I, Yes, I don't, I, I'm not going to say something super obnoxious, but I, sh I should, but yes, like, um, you know, that's, that's part of it. I, I just, um, the second part of the question is, yeah, it's here to say, I mean, you know, Mark Andreessen's famous software is eating the world, like is, um, you know, when you repeat that, you really think it, I mean, every part, like if I see one more startup in the trucking space, like, sorry if anyone has a trucking startup, but like, I can't believe how many trucking startups there are. Corey, have you invested in any trucking startups? Okay, good. Um, but it, it really isn't, and it's, uh, it, it's only gonna continue. Um, and, you know, and thus, I, I, I would imagine what happens is that you see this, not bifurcation, but this splintering into many different areas of like a kind of remaking of the world around tech where you'll have some lumbering old company, um, maybe someday it'll be Google, um, and then you'll always have like the high performers, the people in it for the right reasons, the people that, you know, think like, um, you know, that, that want to change things and are like the rebels and so on. Um, so I think it'll just be more of a splintering um, into different groups. Like today, you know, like, um, you know, it's an exciting time. It's it feels much like the remake. And again, I hate to reference the '90s because that's how old I am. I'm so old, but um, you know, it just feels like Mark Andreessen up there and Netscape browser, and one sees the the web and the internet and like thinks how expansive this could be and how expansive this is. And there's like an incredible rush. And uh, what we're seeing now with OpenAI. And, and others and the rush of founders, it's no longer, you know, you no longer have to get your PhD from CMU and um, machine learning, like any great engineer can build something amazing on top of, uh, uh, you know, using AI. And it's, uh, it is going to be like the biggest bubble of all time. And, and I say that in a good way because uh, every, you know, every phenomenon gets overplayed. You know, there's a Gartner hype bubble. Um, there's this notion of capitalism as a pendulum. 
like it never stays, you know, it, it's either like one direction really, really amazing or the other direction terrible. Um, so we always overdo things like in this like society environment we're in, like we'll overplay it and there'll be a big collapse, but some incredible stuff in the world will be changed. Look at today versus like the 90s, like uh, the, the most important, uh, like the amount of innovation and, and value and lives helped and so on is, is incredible. Um, I won't just boil it down to market caps, uh, you know, of 2023 versus market caps of 1995. Uh, let's see, are we getting, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of just like a cool hack for in Columbus or even like a weekend um, that does like something that's that's central and kind of cool to my topics, but also not mm-hmm. actually any of mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the time the reasoning, I mean, I could, yeah, the reason behind it is primarily to found some sort of um, create like a foundation mm-hmm. um, of technical knowledge and this base that you can build on to actually go on and build that you know future company that will change the world. So I guess I was wondering how does that fit into your picture of, mm-hmm. um, of you know, building meaningful things? Because is it important for us to focus on what's important now and work towards that mission? Or is it okay to kind of play around with just building through technical knowledge and then go into this? Um, yeah, that's a great question. The question is, um, like I have short-term memory issues and so I'm like, forget the question. The question, no, the question is, is that, um, like students like throughout history have always like had pet fun projects um, and hack around and play with new things available um, but they're not it's you know not going to turn into like a Google or so on um, I mean the response is like I, I love that personally like I think it's like critically important to, to learn and to um, experiment and to understand more uh, I've you know, I had a friend, um, I have a friend, Joe, and he, um, when he was in college, he and his um, roommate, like, were hacking around, and they built something, and they got in trouble, or they got in trouble with the administration, and, like, got on some type of probation, and Joe's parents were like, if you ever spend another minute with that Mark Zuckerberg kid, I will disown you. True story. Um, and so, like, the point there is, is that, like, yes, that, that, like, experimentation and learning and understanding is, like, you know, it's like training in a sense. I don't want to, like, turn it into, like, oh, I must, like, this checklist of things to have. It's just that, you know, you have interests and it's fun and, and you do these sort of things and then later you, like, apply them and you're like, oh, wow, I'm learning, you know, I'm applying this. And so it's been this, like, weird pattern where, you know, throughout time, like a lot of great founders have like had these like pet projects. And that's always been um, my business partner from the money remittance business always had like a pet project, like on the side and things like that. Um, So uh, yeah, I think it's incredibly important. Yes. Yes. So just like going back to the definition of ownership, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking one, another way to interpret ownership could be like, like, how do you really try to interpret Mm-hmm. What's your advice and what do you think is like what framework for trying to decide like what is your Um I'm probably the uh, not uh, so the question is like how do you find your like purpose in life and you know I I just kind of got lucky you know like I could maybe say um you know like I wasn't sure what I wanted to do after college so I went to grad school and grad school is just kind of fun or kind of interesting, intellectually challenging. So I liked that part of it. Um, and then I thought about like different, and I'm gonna say it like, should I be a lawyer? Should I be a doctor? I had the, you know, like med school requirements. Should I apply to med school? And, um, you know, ended up like at a time when the internet was booming. Um, okay, I'm gonna admit it. I, I was interning yeah. in a, uh, like a neuro lab, like, working on like um, we, we were studying the brains of rhesus monkeys. Um, they would use psychotic, we would have them move their eyes, it's called a saccade, 
and measure the output of that and map that in MATLAB. Um, but it, we were a Unix lab and that internet thing was taking off and like I had two friends like total at Stanford that were in tech at the time. Um, and that's how I kind of made that transition. Um, it was just enthralling and, and exciting and very new. Um, yeah, I, I just think you have to put yourself out there and take a lot of risk. Um, and when you find something you like, uh, be persistent. I'd say, I always get asked like, what's, you know, advice do you have? And persistence is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, probably a lot of people made a good decision to step out of the Web3 space and become AI, you know, move into AI, which we see a lot. But, you know, the folks that remain and are big believers in the Web3 space are going to prevail over the long term, um, you know, I think. Um, but I've also been laughed at about that because I'm told that uh, Web3 is an entire fraud. But, uh, no, so persistence is very important. I mean, I would say the, the tale of Zoom, you know, I was just a board member at the time that we were public and PayPal approached us, but you know, it seemed great, like let's sell the company, but that was 2015 and now there are two, um, pri two public companies, Remitly and Wise, which is more like TransferWise, that are larger now than Zoom was at that time. And had we stayed independent, um, you know, I can only imagine how uh, it, we have, a, we had a really great CEO step in, John Coons, who's still over at PayPal. Um, but, you know, it'd be interesting to see that company go to the distance. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you made the point that, you know, a lot of people coming into tech, uh, the status mm -hmm. is maybe not necessary. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's open to access to a lot of people, so would you say that by bringing more people into the space, it's been more positive, uh, or go against it? Um, that's a good point. Uh, so the question is, isn't it a net positive bringing more people into the spa space? Uh, that's a very good point, because like your s sample size, you know, your N is much bigger. And so you're gonna, you know, like even if you have a lower percentage of, you know, true, you know, diehards versus phonies, that the true diehards is still larger in aggregate. So see, this is why you should point that out because I'm cranky and grouchy old man. Like, thank you for bringing, like you just, you know, like you made my day happy by pointing <laughs> that out. I shouldn't look at it that way. Yes. So I guess on the topic, Well, I like this truth is, uh, so I've been asked the Peter Thiel question of what's the truth I believe that, that very few people do. And the response to that is like, in just a matter of like months, maybe weeks, um, it's becoming conventional knowledge. And that is that San Francisco will have a miraculous revitalization as a tech city um, by the end of 2023, and um, I posted that on Twitter, and uh, Delian like ripped me a new one, and I like like blame Delian because he's fun to <laughs> like. I'm like the only person that can go after Delian. Like he's funny. I like him. Um, and then Keith Raboys like gave me a lull and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's gonna happen. It's inevitable. Like there's an. I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of what's happening in. Hayes Valley uh, and you know OpenAI is this epicenter. Like it's happening faster than I could ever imagine. Like the number of people coming into town, like from all around the world, uh, is is insane around AI. And San Francisco is the de facto capital. So um, does anyone think that that answers the question well, or do you think like uh, it's obvious? Okay, good. Well. Yeah, I, I think you still want everyone in the room to, to not believe you, but I think it's so obvious now. But I don't know. Okay, more questions. Uh, who? Uh, how about in the brown in the shirt in the back? Thanks. So, having um, founded companies in the early and mid 2000s, um, do you think, or have you noticed any sort of 
No, zero. I, I think they're immutable. Like I think, um, like, um, you know, like name a auto baron. Well, I guess there's a new one, but you know, Elon in any era would have done the same. In you know, yes, he does a lot of distasteful things that people don't like, um, but. You know, he's the exact same person as, as is a, you know, maybe a Rockefeller or, or maybe not an Edison, but, um, you know, any of the robber barons or so on. Um, and a Steve Jobs would have been a Steve Jobs and is successful in any era. And it's, yeah, it's just a, a general characteristics that apply anywhere. Great question. Okay. My favorite is, I have a friend, uh, I won't say his name, um, but he um, he was involved in the government, and so he was working for the government for a long time, and um, when he got out of the government, you know, like making a terrible salary, when he was in private industry, he was in the, like, finance area, and so when he got out, he would um, host, like, calls with these, like, hedge funds and things like that, or he'd offer that. And they'd pay him uh, $250,000 an hour. Um, and so he would like, uh, you know, like at like the 58th or like 57th minute, he'd be like, time for one more question, one more question only. You know, like I'm not going to go past another minute, even though you're paying me. And so he'd stop right on the hour. So that every time I hear it, I think of that. But um, okay. I, who did I ask? Did I already call on someone? Have you given a question yet? Okay, yes, please. Um, so I'm sure you've heard many pitches over the years. What is the worst pitch you've ever heard? Oh, that's a, <laughs> the worst pitch I've ever heard um, over the years. So many bad ones. But, you know, like, uh, it's like a fine line between bad and unconventional. Um, oh, my God. Like, you've just, like, caught me at a moment where, I, I mean, I must be able to. I got a terrible pitch recently. Um, and I have to like disguise it a little bit. And it was so bad because, you know, I'll just, I'll make it a learning lesson. The founder um, didn't do their homework. And so, you know, my question was like, if I introduced you to Eventbrite to pitch your product, to like, you know, act as an alpha tester, um, you know, wh what do you think? And the response was like, Eventbrite, I haven't used that in years. Like, why would I do that? And I'm, and I'm like, dude, I co-founded the company. You're like, what? It's like, what are you thinking? <laughs> anyway, it hurt. <laughs> yeah, I, you already gave a, asked a question. Have you asked a question? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, but he hasn't asked a question. Is there, like, we need, yeah, more questions. Yes, question. Yeah, just generally curious, what stuff gets you excited, and what's a few things we're going to be working on? Oh, gosh. Um, like, I have, like, a bazillion ideas, um, but I generally think, yeah, I think, I mean, ideas don't have to originate from a person, but, you know, like, incubations are very dangerous, like, so I, I'm going to point that out. Um, the question was about, did I ask? Yeah, the, the question was like, what ideas I think are good? What um, My response to that is like, first, um, like I'm, incubations always worry me because in like 99.9% .9 of the cases, except for Snowflake, um, <laughs> the, it's like the only one, like incubations are like fabricated companies and it's this whole ownership thing, like where like these incubators like hire a CEO. They get like a CEO of recruiters and they hire their CEO of recruiter and you get your 6% stock. And so nobody's like a really passionate owner of that company. Um, so that's my like thought on incubations for the most part, even though we're working on one, but it's different. Um, <laughs> it's better than... It's better than Snowflake, yeah. Uh, and um, what you should work on, I'm, I love to look at platforms, as you've heard with like a payments platform, PayPal, 
and Stripe came along, um, and Stripe was even a better platform. But when Stripe was starting, um, Patrick and John, like, I, you know, wanted to stab me. I'm like, who are these little, you know? And they said, like, here's our business. And I'm like, this will never work, you know? Like, you, you, PayPal does this much better. And I regret saying that and not investing, but everyone's got the stories. So again, looking at platforms right now, you know, whether it's Dolly or Stable Diffusion or GPT-3, um, there are more platforms out there. Like, so I like building on top of platforms and there's an infinite number of businesses can be created like vertically or horizontally. It'll transform, you know, like GPT-3 will trend and soon GPT-4, which um, will be delayed immensely, but um, yeah, we'll transform customer service, we'll transform sales, we'll transform, but, but then like the verticalization of it like uh, is, is immense. So there's, you know, like that's a great area, but um, you know, like I was talking to my friends at Founders Fund and we're like, gosh, this AI thing is so maddening because you, you love it, but you also hate it because everyone's doing it. And, how can you be contrarian if everyone's doing it? Um, but I, I, my best advice is look for um, uh, a platform or any kind of, in, and then the other side is do something totally non-obvious. Look for, um, you know, a big market that's got an incumbent with big margins that's been sitting there for a long time. It, it, you, I, you've already asked a question. Do you, have you asked a question? You got it. No, oh, oh, sorry. Ask the question, yeah, please. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask. I mean, I guess following up on that, specifically with generative, how do you think you can build something? Like at the end of the day, mm -hmm. everyone's attacking different verticals, mm -hmm. but there's a big question about are incumbents going to win because they have that skill set and distribution, mm -hmm. and so as a startup, maybe you need generative to win. But then, how do you actually build up that moat and build a long-term advantage in mm -hmm. whatever? Moats, um, like speed and talent is most important in these incredibly busy fields. And so, you know, how do you um, out hustle, uh, how, how do you outmaneuver, you know, 100 people doing the same, um, you know, type of like canvas to create stable diffusion, like the next Adobe, something or other. Um, and, you know, so speed in, I mean, all I can say is speed and aggression. And then when it comes down to, there'll be, and over time, you kind of build up those those barriers, like you find. So, you know, in the case of Eventbrite, like all we were originally was just like a simple form that you'd fill it out as an event creator and publish it. And, and, and the attendee would come and purchase a ticket and very simple. But over time, you know, we, we you know, kind of shaped and molded and built different pieces. Like, first of all, just a friction-free, simple experience is, is incredibly important. And I think that the best founders are always thinking about that with 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 their users, their customers. Um, secondly, you know, we would find, you'd be just very observant of what's working and what's not working. Um, you know, if you go to the PayPal example, like PayPal thought that, uh, originally that you would just send money to your friends and that's how it would work. But it, it took a long time for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer payments Venmo thing to actually take off. Um, and instead, like people organically, there were a few sellers that started to use it on, on eBay. Somebody would like copy and paste the PayPal logo onto their eBay page, their um, page where they're selling a teapot or whatever. And, um, and they started to see transactions there. And one team was like, we got to stop this. They're not supposed to use it for that. And luckily, you know, Max and it's like, no, this is good. And so they would integrate, like they saw that and they would, you know, make a simple, you know, kind of plaid-esque enter your eBay username and password and it would just embed the payments um, button and everything into it and lower the friction and just kept like building. And then there was enormous fraud at PayPal and we had enormous amounts of fraud at Eventbrite that was very different from merchant um, physical goods fraud and building, how do you build a fraud system that can stop the bad players and 
make it easy for the good players. Like most fintech sites either make it very difficult for anyone to sign up to stop fraud, or they make it very easy for everyone to sign up and get overrun with fraud and lose incredible amounts of money. And so these things kind of come with time, but you've just got to make sure you have the best people and move fast. I think that's it. Thank you so much. This was fun. Thank you.